My name is Brendan Scott, and I am the historian in residence at Cavan County Council. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce the 2021 online Decade of Centenary Lecture Series. This is a series of six lectures which will deal with local and national issues dating from the revolutionary period of the early 20th century. They begin on the 14th of October at 7.30 p.m. and run for six consecutive weeks on Thursdays at the same time. And all lectures can be accessed either live or later on at facebook.com forward slash Calvin Library uh, and also at uh, www.calvinlibrary.ie forward slash events. This online lecture series, which has been held in association with Calvin County Council's Historian in Residence program, uh, forms part of Calvin County Council's Decade of Centenaries program and is supported by the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gaeltacht, Sport and Media under the Decade of Centenaries 2012 to 23 initiative. And as a historian in residence, I really want to thank the library service, especially Emma um, Clancy, Jonathan Smith and Sinead McArdle uh, for all of their hard work in putting together these lectures uh, and making sure that everything runs smoothly. And I also want to thank as well Owen Doyle, Director of Service, and Tommy Ryan as well, the Chief Executive of Calvin County Council for their continued support and interest in this programme. Uh, tonight's speaker, Dr. Mel Farrell, is talking about Calvin's reaction to the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in 1921. And I'm delighted to say that Mel's talk, along with uh, seven other talks uh, taken uh, from last year's lecture series and from this year's lecture series, uh, are coming together and uh, to form a book which will be launched on the 4th of November. Uh, and it gives me great pleasure uh, to thank you all uh, for viewing uh, uh, this lecture, and I hope you stay with us for the next six weeks, and also to thank Dr. Farrell for his wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan, uh, for the invitation, and I'm delighted to be speaking here about Kenty Cavan and the Anglo-Irish Treaty as part of this uh, lecture series. I've had a couple of tech issues here um this evening in, in in my attempt to record this lecture so um i just hope that uh, it works properly for me this time um the joys of the new normal so at 10 minutes past two in the morning of Tuesday, the 6th of December, 1921, the Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed in Downing Street. Although it fell short of Irish aspirations for full independence as a 32 county republic, the Arthur Griffith led Irish delegation accepted the deal. There followed four weeks of intense debate at national and local level with the Sinn Féin cabinet, the Dáil, local county and district councils and other bodies all having their say on the terms of this historic settlement. The treaty offered the 26 counties of Southern Ireland as defined in the 1920 Government of Ireland Act, Dominion status as an Irish free state alongside Australia, Canada, New Zealand and South Africa within the newly emerging British Commonwealth. Members of the Free State Parliament would have to swear an oath of allegiance to the new state and an oath of fidelity to the British monarch as head of the Commonwealth. In Article 12, the treaty recognised the right of Northern Ireland, also established under its 1920 legislation, to opt out of the proposed Free State, with the Boundary Commission to determine the frontier between the two jurisdictions. This proposal for a boundary commission was suggested as a means of sidestepping the issue of partition and leaving the border to be settled at a future date. Griffith and the other senior member of the Irish delegation, Michael Collins, weighed up their options and concluded that they had to agree to these terms. Now they had to return home to convince the Dáil, the various arms of the independence movement and the country itself that this was a necessary compromise. Unknown to the Dáil and the public, however, 
the Sinn Féin cabinet had entered into negotiations in the knowledge that compromise was inevitable. And with Damon de Valera's scheme for external association as its negotiating position. This talk will focus on the peace settlement as it was received in County Cavan and that county's contribution to the great national debate for and against ratification. As the constituency of treaty architect Arthur Griffith and the county that stood facing the new frontier between the proposed Free State and Northern Ireland, Cavan is an intriguing case study. Although it would not rank as the most militant of counties during the War of Independence, Cavan was one of the first to mobilise the new Sinn Féin in 1917 and was a pioneer of the party's arbitration courts, which were, of course, the precursor of the Dáil court system, which was formalised in June 1920. In addition, while the fate of the treaty was decided in the Dáil, it is clear from the debates that public opinion weighed heavily on many of the deputies. In Cavan, as elsewhere, the Sinn Féin controlled county council, urban councils, rural district councils, Sinn Féin branches and farming associations all played a part in the national discussion. And of course, the treaty was really decided in that pivotal four week period between the 6th of December 1921 and the vote on the 7th of January 1922. The constituency of Cavan in 1921 was a merger of the old Cavan East and Cavan West constituencies. And in 1921 was represented by three TDs. Arthur Griffith, whose ancestors had hailed from the county, was first elected in the famous East Cavan by-election of June 1918, when he had defeated the Irish Parliamentary Party's John F. O'Hanlon in a crushing uh, blow for the Home Rule cause. Griffith was joined as a TD for Cavan by his close personal friend and veteran Sinn Féinor, Sean Milroy, and by Peter Paul Galligan who had fought in the Easter Rising before serving as uh, the commander of the volunteers uh, in West Cavan. Cavan's representation in the Dáil was complicated, however, by the fact that two of its TDs were among the six Dáil deputies who had been elected to serve uh, for two different constituencies. So Arthur Griffith and Milroy had also been elected uh, for, for Mana and Tyrone, uh, as well as Cavan, and this became a major controversy during the local uh, treaty debate in Cavan. While attitudes to the treaty, which of course was major international news in December 1921, would remain uh, in a state of flux in the aftermath of its signing, at leadership level, two distinct factions quickly emerged. The party president and symbolic head of the Republic, Eamon de Valera, landed a heavy blow by denouncing the treaty out of hand and voting against it during a marathon five hour cabinet meeting on the 8th of December. De Valera called into question the action of the delegation in signing the document without referring back to colleagues in Dublin. Ministers Cahill Brua and Austin Stack sided with de Valera against the treaty while W.T. Cosgrave voted with the three cabinet ministers who had been on the Irish delegation, Collins, Griffith and Robert Barton, to ensure that ministers recommended the treaty to the Dáil by a vote of four votes to three. This cabinet meeting took place against a backdrop of popular support for the treaty, with that week's local and national newspapers coming out strongly in support of the settlement. In its December 10th issue, the Anglo-Celt declared on its front page that news of the settlement had received, quote, the utmost satisfaction and assured readers that goodwill expressions had been sent from all over the world. Ireland under the treaty would take its place among the nations of the world, while the new tricolour prevalent in recent years will, quote, continue as the flag of the Irish Free State. Um, and I just want to say at this point that uh, the Anglo-Celt seemed to operate at this stage on the basis that the acceptance of the treaty was a foregone conclusion. And in, in its next issue on the 17th of December clarified that 
uh, news of the uh, De Valera's opposition uh, at Cabinet had only reached the paper late on Thursday night uh, before they went to press went to press on uh, on Friday the 9th of December. So that's why uh, they struck a very optimistic tone about the treaty. And in that uh, 17th of December issue, uh, the full text of what the paper described as the quote historical document was reproduced in full on page three. And uh, again, um, the paper clarified that, uh, you know, that they had only heard of de Valera's opposition to the treaty late on Thursday night, but still the paper seemed to take uh, it for granted that the treaty would be accepted. Looking at the positives, uh, the paper noted that, quote, British troops will be out of Ireland in about 10 days after the treaty has been ratified. And that day's editorial dealt with the issue of partition, uh, believing, quote, there will be an agreement between North and South, uh, and that Ireland would be, uh, quote, a united free state. Uh, believing that, quote, the members of the Northeastern Territory will ultimately grasp the hand of friendship, which through the treaty is held out to them. Uh, and I, I believe that the editorial's optimistic uh, line here on partition was based on remarks that James Craig had made on the 7th of December, uh, when he stated that peace was possible, quote, if we all work together with patience and goodwill. And of course, as we, as we know, subsequently, uh, that optimism was misplaced. And a year later, when the treaty came into operation, uh, the Northern Parliament opted out within 24 hours. So while the public domain had greeted the treaty with a mixture of confusion, relief and support in the days after it was signed, its ultimate fate rested with the Dáil, a body that was made up exclusively of Sinn Féin TDs. Many TDs had played an active role in both the Easter Rising and the War of Independence. So to carry a majority of the Dáil, Collins and Griffith, who both accepted a major share of the responsibility uh, for guiding the treaty, uh, through the Dáil, given that they had, of course, been the leaders of the Irish delegation, well, they would need to demonstrate that the settlement, despite its trappings of British imperialism, could in fact be reconciled with the aspirations uh, of the Irish Revolution uh, for full independence, Irish unity and a uh, republican form of government. And that, of course, uh, would form the basis of Michael, Collin Michael Collins' uh, stepping stones to freedom argument. Uh, and of course, many supporters of the treaty were themselves uncomfortable uh, with aspects uh, of the treaty settlement. Although across the treaty divide, uh, it was the uh, stipulation that free state parliamentarians swear an oath before taking their seats that proved most controversial of all. The wording of the oath called for faith and allegiance to the constitution of the free state and that members of the Dáil be faithful to his majesty, King George V, his heirs and successors as head of the Commonwealth. For many Republicans, the oath represented a surrender to the crown and was contra a contravention of their own oath to the Irish Republic. <clears throat> Although Griffith and Collins each had their loyalists, a dull majority for the treaty was by no means a foregone conclusion. The debates began with a bitter row, in fact, between de Valera and Griffith. As he recounted the instructions issued to the delegation, de Valera claimed that these were, quote, all done with the exception of paragraph three, that the text of any draft treaty about to be signed would be submitted to Dublin and reply awaited. And of course, uh, on the 3rd of December, Griffith and Collins argued they had brought the uh, what was essentially Britain's last word uh, to the cabinet uh, uh, at that uh, crucial meeting on the 3rd of December before the treaty was signed. Griffith immediately rose to challenge de Valera's accusation, stating, I wish to say as regards any suggestion that the plenipotentiaries exceeded their instructions that I, as chairman of the delegation, immediately reject it. Griffith's denials, however, were not enough to ward off the following headlines in the Anglo-Celt. 
Mr. de Valera says the instructions were not carried out. Another argument ensued about whether it was in the public interest to discuss the delegation's credentials and the instructions they were issued with in public. Unsurprisingly, Collins and Griffith took exception to de, to de Valera on this point. And in the end, all sides agreed to permit private discussion of the settlement's genesis and leaving matters pertaining to the ratification to the public session. Although the private sessions were dominated by um, the origins of the, of, the treaty, uh, of the treaty document as signed, Griffith and Collins worked to refute Republican accusations that the treaty was a betrayal of those who had died for a republic. And they, and they were helped in this um, by the prominence given to pro-treaty deputies who had been prominent in the War of Independence. And these, of course, would include Sean McKeown, Sean Hales, um, Owen O'Duffy and Richard Mulcahy. And these individuals were able to offer realistic assessments of the uh, military situation as it was uh, at the time that the treaty was signed. Uh, interestingly, actually, uh, McKeown, uh, in his speech, uh, he on the 17th of December, he addressed the lack of arms and ammunition at his disposal and claimed that he was supporting the treaty because of the proposed evacuation of Britain's armed forces, which he saw as a guarantee of Irish interests. On the second day of the private session, de Valera had introduced his document number two for external association, which he presented as an alternative to the treaty. And I remember the deputies were not aware that the cabinet had agreed to negotiate for external association. I can't really go into detail here on external association, but it is important to note um, because of the context of the local and national debate on the treaty. In essence, de, Valera, de Valera's alternative proposed that an Irish, uh, an independent Irish state would voluntarily associate with the self-governing dominions of the emerging Commonwealth without itself being a member. However, its introduction so early in the debate proved, according to John Regan, a gross miscalculation. Republicans had hardened in their resolve to secure a republic, while the pro-treatyites seized on the opportunity to demonstrate to deputies that despite his opposition to the treaty, de Valera was not offering them a route to an Irish republic. In heated exchanges with de Valera, Cavan TD Sean Milroy focused on this point, reminding deputies that they were debating not the treaty versus the republic, but, quote, the differences between the treaty and document number two. The Dáil, return, the Dáil public debate resumed on Monday, the 19th of December. And on the commencement, the Dáil was informed that de Valera wished to uh, withdraw his document number two and have it, quote, regarded as confidential. This, of course, um, was opposed by pro-treaty members. However, the Cancorlia insisted that they had to proceed with the order of business, which was, uh, you know, the resumption of the debate for ratification of the treaty. Frustrated, Arthur Griffith, uh, who was to propose the motion that the Dáil accept the treaty, stated, uh, while I shall, so far as I can, respect President de Valera's wish, I am not going to hide from the Irish people that the alternative is that, the, to, to, uh, of what the alternative uh, is to that which is being proposed. Griffith's speech was cogent, and as leader of the Irish delegation, offered a stout defence of the delegation's performance. Pointedly, he noted that the task which was given to us was as hard as was ever placed on the shoulders of men. We faced that task. We knew that whatever happened, we would have our critics and we made up our minds to do whatever was right and disregard whatever criticism might occur. We went. The responsibility is on our shoulders. We took the responsibility in London and we take the responsibility in Dublin. I signed that treaty not as the ideal thing, but fully believing, as I believe now, it is a treaty honourable to Ireland and safeguards the vital interests of Ireland. 
referring to de Valera's alternative proposals, Griffith stated that an effort had been made outside to represent that a certain number of men stood uncompromisingly for the Republic. The gentlemen on the other side are prepared to go into the empire for war and peace and treaties and to keep out for other matters. And that is what the Irish people have got to know is the difference. Does all this quibble of words, because it is merely a quibble of words, being that Ireland is asked to throw away this treaty and go back to war. So far as my power or voice extends, not one young Irishman's life shall be lost on that quibble. Griffith went on then to underline, as I state on the slide, uh, what had been won by the plenipotentiaries. While the treaty was a uh, while the treaty was a compromise, it quote is a treaty of equality. Because of that, I am standing by it. We have come back from London with that treaty. Sir Stuyt Naheran recognised the free state of Ireland. We have brought back the flag. We have brought back the evacuation of Ireland after seven hundred years by British troops and the formation of an Irish army. This was, he argued, an historic opportunity to rebuild quote. Gaelic civilization that had broken down in the Battle of Kinsale. And uh, the Cavan TD concluded by asking the Dáil and Irish people everywhere to, quote, ratify this treaty, end this bitter conflict of centuries, end it forever, take away that poison that has been rankling in the two countries and ruining the relationship of good neighbours. Michael Collins developed a much more aggressive defense of the, of the settlement. He made, in fact, what all sides acknowledged was a very strong speech, emphasizing the gains inherent in the treaty settlement. Arguing that Britain's connection to Ireland had been maintained by the military presence of its armed forces, Collins argued, quote, the disappearance of that military strength gives us the chief proof that our national liberties are established. Furthermore, he refuted de Valera's charge that a better result would have been achieved through more skillful handling uh, by pointing out that any fault with the makeup of the delegation rested with the doll and by implication de Valera. Uh, if they wanted a better settlement, they should have picked a better uh, negotiating team. On the question of the Commonwealth, uh, Collins, in fact, argued we have got rid of the word empire because, of course, the, the treaty was the first occasion in which the term Commonwealth had been used uh, to describe the self-governing dominions and claimed, in fact, that the other dominions would become guarantors of Irish independence. Uh, Collins famously, of course, also addressed anti-treaty arguments that, uh, you know, about the, the dead who had died for a republic. Uh, by asking the, the members of the Dáil to focus on the living uh, rather than the dead and urging the uh, deputies to accept responsibility for the important decision that was before them in the country. In a heated clash with de Valera, uh, and, uh, uh, there were uh, several heated clashes between Milroy and de Valera during the Dáil Treaty debates. Milroy asserted that the treaty was a stupendous achievement and through it, we are smashing down the barriers that obstruct the march of the Irish nation. Arguing that, quote, the act of union took away from the Irish people their right, such as they had to direct, mould and control their own laws. This treaty brings back to Ireland those powers. Referring to de Valera, Milroy stated that, quote, there are other things the president said I can only attribute to the impulse at the moment. He described the treaty, which, as I have said, brings back these powers to Ireland as the most unparalleled surrender in history. I think he must have been thinking of the surrender of these things on the part of the British government. Cries of hear, hear. He spoke of this as the most ignoble document that Irishmen could put their hands to. I can only put that down to some wave of eccentricity or distraction of mind when he was carried away with the flood of his own fury. Strong words indeed. Milroy's speech in tone and content 
angered anti-treaty deputies. Mary McSweeney stated in the course of a marathon speech that lasted two hours and 40 minutes, that it had made her, quote, ashamed to think the public was listening to it. And Sean McEntee of Monaghan referred to it as a rhetorical thunderstorm. Uh, I'm very conscious of the time here. Uh, partition um, was largely um, the, uh, the elephant in the room, so to speak, during the Dáil Treaty debates. It received remarkably uh, scant attention during this most important important of debates uh, on the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Um, the the anti-treatyites uh, over the course of the debates, they tended to focus on the limitations of the proposed state's independence, um, you know, and, and they tended to neglect partition. Um, uh, there were some notable exceptions, of course, uh, Sean McEntee, uh, chief among them. Uh, and of course, uh, Collins had dealt with it to an extent in his uh, speech on Monday, the 19th of December, um, when he said that, uh, you know, they had uh, said that they would not coerce the Northeast into an Irish, uh, into an Irish state, and that the treaty has made an effort to deal with the issue. Uh, and has made an effort, in my opinion, to deal with it on lines that will lead very rapidly to goodwill and the entry of the North East under the Irish Parliament. I don't say it is an ideal arrangement, but if our policy is, as has been stated, a policy of non-coercion, then let somebody else get a better way out of it. Um, three days later, anti-treaty uh, Belfast-born TD Sean McEntee did return to the issue of partition, challenging the pro-treatyites on the implications of the settlement's proposal for a boundary commission. Um, and indeed, McEntee uh, specified uh, that he was, uh, or uh, McEntee directed his criticism at CAF and TD Sean Milroy, uh, criticizing him as a border, as a, as a TD representing a proposed border constituency uh, for failing to adequately address the issue uh, during his contribution. And uh, again, I I don't uh, I don't have much time here, but uh, McEntee's argument about the Boundary Commission focused on the extent to which he believed the Boundary Commission would actually ensure the partition remained permanent. Uh, for McEntee, the devil was in the detail here. Because there was going to be a Boundary Commission, uh, nationalist areas of Northern Ireland would switch to the Free State. Uh, unionist districts of Monaghan, Cavan and Donegal would switch to Northern Ireland. So you were just further cementing the partition, um, uh, you know, by, by having a Boundary Commission. Because, um, uh, and to quote McEntee here, the Boundary Commission would remove, quote, from Northern Ireland, the strongest force that makes for the unification of Ireland, the strong nationalist minority, which every day tries to bring Northern Ireland into the Irish state. Their place in Northern Ireland would instead be taken by certain sections of the population of Monaghan, Cavan and Donegal, so the North would remain outside the Irish state. So um, again, it is regrettable, particularly given uh, for a county like Cavan, the socio-economic, cultural, um, you know, impacts of partition, that the question of partition did not feature more prominently uh, in the treaty debate. With so many members of the Dáil determined to speak, it was clear on the afternoon of the 22nd of December that a Christmas adjournment would be necessary. In our, uh, and the Dáil agreed, in fact, to adjourn until the 3rd of January. However, there had been an amendment uh, before this was agreed um, for uh, which was put down again by Sean McEntee, which was that the uh, debate should be continued through tonight and tomorrow and so on until we finish and that there be no adjournment over Christmas so as not to have the people's Christmas clouded over with uncertainty. This reflects the extent to which um, you know, the anti-treatyites wanted to have the debate before Christmas. The pro-treatyites knew that um, a Christmas adjournment would allow public opinion, uh, you know, influence uh, some of the more wavering uh, deputies who were unsure um, uh, as to which way they would vote in the division. Um, and um, subsequently, uh, as I say, the Dáil did vote for the adjournment. 
um, and um, at the at the end, uh, just before the the, the doll um, uh, went on its recess, De Valera, in fact, made a plea that there be no speech making uh, over the course uh, of the recess, uh, which uh, which of course um, uh, was not fully adhered to. So as expected, Christmas 1921 revealed not so much public enthusiasm for the settlement, but rather a strong desire for peace and an end to hostilities. By the time that the Dáil debate resumed on the 3rd of January, some 328 public bodies had come out to endorse the treaty, with just five declaring their opposition to it. In their Christmas Eve issue, papers such as the Longford Leader and the Anglo-Celt had their first opportunity to comment on the Dáil debates as they had unfolded in public session. Under the heading, The Treaty Fight, the Anglo-Celt offered detailed coverage of the public session, noting that the pro and anti-treaty leaders had sat on opposite sides of the Cancorlia, which was a sign of the, the deepening split within the Sinn Féin leadership. The paper captured the gravity of the situation, stating that it was, quote, doubtful if Ireland has ever approached a more momentous Christmas in the whole course of her existence from that which confronts her at present. While the plenipotentiaries had, quote, signed a treaty in the, the name of those who nominated them, those opposing them argue that they had no authority to enter into a binding agreement. Critical that De Valera's uh, proposal for an alternative to the treaty had not been made public, the editorial concluded with a warning from history. The, uh, the decision of the Dáil was not known when we were going to press at 6 p.m. last evening, but whatever differences are amongst the members, they cannot very seriously affect the people if they do not permit themselves to be rushed into hostile camps and renew the old strife which followed the Parnell split. With every confidence that the wiser councils shall prevail, we once more tender the all-time wish of a happy Christmas and a bright, contented and prosperous new year. In Cavan, as elsewhere, pro-treaty sentiment was quick to assert itself, with enough adherents emerging in early January to carry majorities on public bodies and in the local Sinn Féin uh, organisation in the, in the county. On the 28th of December, Cavan Urban District Council passed a resolution urging the county's uh, deputies uh, to vote for ratification of the treaty. Uh, and the, the, uh, the motion stated, um, you know, in terms of the opponents of the treaty, um, we uh, request quote them for the sake of our dear country to bury their differences and stand with Arthur Griffith and Sean McKeown for the ratification of the treaty. Coote Hill uh, UDC passed a similar resolution when according to the Anglo-Celt a public meeting there on the 22nd of December heard that all quote organizations and representatives of public opinion assembled here in public meetings strongly demand ratification of the treaty. Among the more interesting local debates in Cavan, however, were those that take place uh, during the special meeting of the Cavan County Council on New Year's Day 1922 and at a public gathering of Cavan Farmers uh, Union on the 3rd of January. Echoing the Dáil's deliberations, again, partition was uh, surprisingly absent from these local deliberations with contributors on each side instead focusing on the sacrifices that had been made during the War of Independence and whether the substance of the treaty uh, had been worth it. Local treaty supporters stressed that while the settlement was imperfect, it offered a stepping stone to full independence, while those who rejected the treaty saw it as a betrayal of the dead and the oath that they had taken to the Republic. At the County Council, uh, Councillor Fitzsimons' motion for the treaty declared that while it imperfect, it, quote, safeguarded the interests of the Gaelic nation. And the alternative is such that acting in the name of our constituents, we now formally pronounce in its favour. The text went on to endorse the public statements of Griffith and Milroy and called on Galligan to join them in voting for the uh, treaty's ratification.
Councillor Fitzsimon said he saw no difficulty in transferring his allegiance from the Republic to the Free State, and other councillors uh, went on to echo these remarks. Um, indeed, uh, uh, Councillor Lynch remarked that he saw he, no difficulty with the oath uh, because he believed that the treaty uh, was bringing the Republic, uh, bringing the day nearer when there would be a Republic. A Republican counter motion by Councillor uh, Boylan was more simply stated, quote, that as Republican representatives, we do not approve of the treaty. When asked if he wanted to make a speech, Boylan replied that the resolution speaks for itself. We were elected as Republicans. That's all. 17 councillors voted for the treaty, with uh, two voting against. After voting to accept the peace settlement, the council then turned its attention to the question of Cavan's possible uh, exclusion from the Dáil Treaty uh, vote. Uh, and uh, you know, it had, the Dáil had um, rejected uh, Milroy's uh, pleas, uh, you know, for 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 those uh, deputies uh, Griffith, De Valera, Collins, Owen McNeil, and Milroy himself to be able to vote for both constituencies that they were elected for. Um, however. Uh, it had been stipulated that they would only be able to vote uh, from one of their constituencies. Um, Cavan County Council tried to have alternative deputies elected, but again, uh, this proposal was in vain. Somewhat surprisingly, it fell to the 3rd of January meeting of the county's farmers uh, to hear the most convincing local argument against the treaty made. Thomas Smith, a pro-treatyite, opened the meeting of the Farmers' Union by calling on the people to give expression to their views so that their public representatives would be guided. Smith was adamant that each side in the debate contained, quote, thinking men and fighting men who were motivated to do the best for the country and called on attendees to make their views known. At this point, Michael Sheridan rose to, quote, enter an emphatic protest against the ratification of this treaty. Sheridan spoke with authority as the brother of the late Tom Sheridan, who died in the Matter Hospital, Dublin, from moon sustained during an attack on the Crown forces near Balignà on the 27th of May, 1920. Another Sheridan brother, Patrick, was also wounded in the incident, but survived. After this uh, attack on the Crown forces, um, Black and Tans uh, RIC uh, raided the Sheridan family home, quote, abusing the parents and set the roof of their house on fire. Given his own family struggles, Michael Sheridan's speech focused on the sacrifices that had been made by those who had paid the ultimate price and questioned whether the treaty was what they had fought for. I'm going to quote uh, Sheridan here. I, for one, will never consent to a unanimous voice going from this meeting in favour of the treaty, because whether you believe it or not, I have been through the mill. I have seen England's paid assassins put my father against the wall with revolvers in his breast. I have seen abuse of my aged mother in search of the house for my wounded brother. I have looked down the barrels of the revolvers. We must all forgive injury, but I shall not forget. And whatever little influence lies in my power shall be used to break the last link that Tone spoke of. For Sheridan, the treaty could not be supported. He believed, quote, in full and complete independence, in a word, separation from England. He could not, therefore, for the life of me, see that we have won our freedom. Um, it may be said this is sentiment, but if ever there is to be a fight again, men, whether they like it or not, must go back to sentiment. Was not sentiment largely responsible for the election of our Republican representatives in 1918? And is sentiment to signify nothing now when it signified everything before or everything then? Mine is a voice in the wilderness. I know, but nevertheless, it will go out most strongly dissenting if this meeting of County Cavan farmers today pass a resolution for ratification of the treaty. Given his own family's um, uh, past uh, uh, str struggles, <coughs> pardon me, Sheridan was able to empathise with those who had paid the ultimate price. 
Although his impassioned plea impacted on those present, the meeting nevertheless voted to add its voice to the growing clamour for ratification of the treaty. Bringing the meeting to a close, however, I think this is really interesting. Smith stated that in declaring the Cavan farmers' endorsement of the settlement, quote, I may add that any country should feel proud of the pluck and courage of Mr. Sheridan in putting forward his views so ably and fearlessly. And there was a round of applause. So it kind of shows some of the mutual respect in County Cavan uh, across uh, the Treaty Divide uh, in, the, in uh, January 1922, which is very interesting. And again, I'm conscious of time. So on the resumption of the Dáil debate in early January, it was clear that the mood of the country during the Christmas adjournment had made an impact. Cork TD JJ Walsh claimed that uh, the break had shown him that nine out of 10 people in that city supported the treaty. And Roscommon Deputy Daniel O'Rourke went even further, confirming that he would have voted against the treaty if the vote was taken before Christmas, and he was still opposed to the treaty, but was now going to vote for it because the people in Roscommon were unanimous in saying to him that there was no alternative but to support the treaty. So he subsequently switched and voted for the treaty. And of course, the treaty was passed narrowly in the Dáil on the 7th of January, 1922, by a vote of 64 to 57. And of course, the conversion of people uh, like Dan O'Rourke uh, was significant and shows the real importance of the Christmas adjournment and the impact of public opinion. All three of Cavan's TDs voted for the treaty, with uh, Griffith and Milroy each protesting that one of the constituencies that they sat for was being disenfranchised. De Valera, of course, resigned as president after the vote uh, for the treaty, and he was replaced by Arthur Griffith uh, by an even tighter margin of 58 votes to 60, with Cavan TD Paul Galligan voting for De Valera as president, even though he had voted for the treaty. So to conclude, in a sign of things to come, the treaty debate ended in verbal violence as Cahill Brewer launched a blistering attack on Michael Collins, whom he denounced as a subordinate in the Department of Defence. The tone of public discourse became ever more bitter as the two sides put their case to the public ahead of the June 1922 general election. In Cavan, public opinion remained aligned with the treaty, with Griffith polling 13,101 first preference votes and, in a triumph of party discipline, bringing in his two pro-treaty running mates, Walter Cole and Sean Milroy, making it a clean sweep for the treaty in uh, the Cavan constituency in the June 1922 election. As I hope this talk has demonstrated, the case for the settlement was won in that critical month between its signing on the 6th of December and the Dáil vote on the 7th of January. While there was little popular enthusiasm for the treaty, it was nevertheless accepted as offering an end to hostilities and the continued presence of the uh, Crown forces, including, of course, the dreaded uh, Black and Tans and Auxiliaries, uh, both of which uh, made their uh, presence felt over the previous uh, 18 months. While the fate of uh, while the fate of the treaty was decided in the Dáil, it is clear that public opinion was a vitally important consideration. The Christmas recess gave Sinn Féin branches and the local county, urban and district councils an opportunity to meet and pressure TDs to vote for ratification. And this, of course, they did narrowly on the 7th of January 1922. And as we saw, you know, there was mutual respect uh, between both sides. Uh, you know, I think the meeting of the Cavan farmers shows that, you know, people understood that, you know, views on either pro or anti you know, came from a genuine place. However, such sentiments, of course, were not enough to prevent the split escalating over the subsequent uh, six months. Uh, and of course, a week after the uh, June 1922 election, um, the, uh, the split escalated into a full scale uh, civil war, which commenced with the attack on the anti-treaty IRA garrison in the four courts on the, uh, at 4 a.m. 
on the 28th of June 1922, that civil war would further harden and cement the treaty divide in towns, communities and families all across the country. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>